were praying about this year, God reminded us of that. And we were led to also have another men's panel for this year's conference. Thank you. And the reason being, we're talking about strength and being strengthened. And we thought that it was important to have men, let women know that they are strong. It is good to have we tell ourselves, but we felt that it would add an extra dimension when we hear men who have themselves been nurtured by strong women, have raised strong women, have nurtured and continue to nurture strong women, tell us, some of us will hear it differently because some of the issues are also because we've heard certain things from that have made us think certain ways. And so when we thought left and right and center, we said, who are these special men? These special men that we must have the proof that they can securely talk about strengthened from woman's perception. And Mr. Feladro Toye came to mind because obviously, obviously, FD is a woman promoter, woman supporter, woman coach, woman everything. So when we had him, we said, who would this second man be now? We thought left, right, and center. So, wait now. Let us get into the panel. So, I called Dr. Mamadou, and I was like, actually, oh, pastor is on my mind, oh. Then Dr. Mamadou said, it came to my mind too. I just did not want to tell you. I said, so this is on two of us minds. Let us go and approach Pastor Pojuda. Please, sir, Aishwali, Aishwali. We want to officially invite you to be with us at B2023. So Pastor kind of gave me bombastic side eye. Kind of, kind of, kind of. But as they have taught us, you will take it in good faith. Then you now go back into your prayer house and say, Lord, touch his heart. Pastor, I will be out of town. I said, nothing will happen. You'll be here. I just want to thank Minister Feladro Toye and Pastor Kwaju for being here. The first time ever at the B Women's Conference. We are honored to have Minister Feladro Toye and honored to have Pastor Specially. Pastor makes everything happen. Like we are standing here, we are seeing stage, we are seeing runway, we are seeing... Please thank Pastor Poju. Stand up! Stand up! Clap! Shout! Honor! Our very own man of God, Apostle, Prophet, Bishop, Teacher, Father, Nurturer! And I'll call up our two moderators for the panel, Dr. Lara Williams, and Mrs. Abimbola Aze, please come up and get the panel session ready. Thank you so much. Please put your hands together for Dr. Lara Williams and Mrs. Abimbola Aze. Thank you. We're going to be inviting Mr. Feladro Toy up on stage. Mr. Feladro Toye is an executive coach, leadership expert, global speaker, and nation builder. He's the founder CEO of the Gemstone Group, a leadership development institution. FD, as he is fondly called, is renowned for his unique style of blended mentoring and coaching to help business and impact leaders achieve exponential growth in their success parameters. At the core of his heart, Fela defines himself as a nation builder, and he has been at the forefront of the movement to build a new Nigeria. He's a recipient of several social, 
Industry and National Awards for his leadership development and nation building, building activities. Feladro Toye is a certified leadership coach of the John Maxwell team and also an accomplished author who has several of his best-selling books published on Amazon. Yeah, you should clap. He is happily married to Tara Feladjiroto. His heart beats. A renowned beauty entrepreneur and chief executive officer of the House of Tara International. And together, they have three sons who think their dad is a superhero. So with a resounding applause, let's welcome Mr. Feladjiro Toy. Thank you very much, sir. I have the privilege of introducing the senior pastor of the Covenant Nation Global. Please put your hands together for Pastor Kwaju Oyemade. I won't tell you what he said. Down. Thank you. His profile. Pastor Kwajo Yemade is the senior pastor and the founder of the Covenant Nation, TCN. He is a highly regarded teacher of the word of faith who draws out insightful lessons from God's word that are applicable to the complexities of everyday life family, business, and nation building. Those of us that are entrepreneurs, when we come for workers' meeting, what do we do? <laughs> Pastor Kwajo Yemade's call to ministry dates to his time as an undergraduate at the University of Lagos and was ordained into ministry by Bishop David Oyedepo, the presiding bishop of Living Faith Ministries Worldwide also known as Winner's Chapel. He has been consistently described as a bridge in the Christian community in Nigeria, a link between the older generation of Christian trailblazers in the country. <laughs> the time is going. <laughs> um, and the younger generation, between entrepreneurs and professionals in business, as well as between the government and the governed. In this regard, he convinced three flagship events annually. The Word of Faith Believers Convention, formerly Wafbeck, now Wolfbeck. <laughs> the platform, which comes up when? The International Conference for Pastors, Ministers, Leaders, and Workers, ICPLMW. Pastor Kwaju is happily married to our own dear Pastor Toy, who is also a dynamic teacher of the word, filmmaker, and content creator. Please put your hands together and welcome Pastor Kwaju Yemade. Can I have my notes, please? Oh, God. Thank you. Okay, so we're going straight into the session. And um, the first question is for both of you. And um, because we're the ones holding the mic, we have decided that Minister Foladro Toye will answer first. 
and then Pastor Kwaju next. The question is this. What is it in your background and your experience growing up that has helped you to become the men that you are today who are able to nurture, grow, protect strong women? And what is your definition of who a strong woman is? Wow. Wow. <laughs> was going to shape the culture for generations to come in what was called the testament. Now, whether it was Isaiah or it was Saul, well, Saul the king or Saul the, later the apostle Paul, all of them lived not knowing that their lives were going to be documented into testaments. Whether it was an Old Testament or a New Testament, they didn't know. They were just doing their thing. I believe that the reason why their names could not have been ignored from the testaments of the Bible was in part because of the quality of lives that they lived, but more important, because of the impact that their lives were going to make on other people. So if there was an Old Testament and a New Testament, who knows whether there's a Now Testament being written? And I believe very strongly that if there is a Now Testament being written, you may find the book according to Boju. You may find it there. I don't know if there will be a Third Testament to be written. But I know one thing for sure, especially the Nigerian version of that book, the West African or the African version of that book, and I'm positive that the global version of that book will have a man who in the, in, the li in the likes of Abraham, God said, I would build a nation through you. And now God is building a covenant nation through this man. So if you would, please help me acknowledge. And if you don't mind, please stand to your feet. If, if, if you've been blessed by this man, we honor you, man of God. Please, we know of your humility. It's legendary. But I didn't do this to embarrass you. I did this because there are many, there are few times we get the opportunity to acknowledge you and acknowledge the work that God is doing through you. We salute you. We love you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much. All right, now I've taken four of my minutes to quickly say something. I'll, I'll summarize a little bit of my, my thoughts. And thank you to Tosin Babatunde and Damilara Olufemi who, Olorun Femi who came with me today. Please help me acknowledge them. And just to quickly say, you know many times people say, well, my wife sends her love and it's not necessarily true. <laughs> well, this time she did send her love. All right, so thank you so much. Um, I am the third of three children. My parents were lecturers in the University of Toronto when I was conceived. 
in the year 1970. I didn't say I was born. I was born in 1971. I was conceived in 1970. And the reason why I accepted to come was because the angel told me that my parents were university lecturers in University of Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> from the gist that I heard that in the sixth or seventh month of my, my mom's pregnancy, my father had a dream and she, he woke my mother up and said, we have to take him home. And they had not done any tests. They already had a boy and a girl. So there was no way they should have known whether it was a boy or a girl. But my father was so convincing that my mother decided to get on a journey and she came home. And so in the end, they had me in, in Oluyo Leibadon. And then they called me Ade Tokumbo. <laughs> so I'm the only Tokumbo that many of you know has, has only one passport. But that part of the story, as true as it is, is also not complete because my parents, um, my father turned out to become the youngest professor in Nigeria in 1975 at the age of 36. But that's not the special part. The special part is that my mom became the first professor of geology in Nigeria, and the only professor of quaternary geology in Africa. So my first female professor, first female professor of geology, and the only female professor of quaternary geology. So what, what does that mean? It, it meant that my father's professorship did not need to find strength on my mother's ignorance. Both of them could be the best that they could be. She was the best student in her class, graduating with a 2-1. He was the best student in his class, graduating in the first class. And yet he was attracted to not a woman whose ignorance would, yeah. would amplify his seeming knowledge. He wasn't intimidated by her hmm. knowledge, by her capacity. He wasn't intimidated. He emp empowered, he enabled, he encouraged, and that was what I grew up knowing. My, there are three kids, I told you, I'm the third of three. My sister, who is the middle child, got into university at the age of 14. She was the youngest medical student in her set, probably in Ife's history. She graduated from medicine at the age of 20. She later went on to become a consultant, obstetrician, and gynecologist, and is now one of the top 100 healthcare quality practitioners in the world. I didn't come to boast about them. I came to tell you because, you see, we as humans, we are elements of nature and nurture. Nature being the divine nature of God in us, but nurture being the way that we are raised and the things that we see. And one of the reasons why it's important for me to tell these stories is that, you see, I don't know of any woman in my growing up that was not aspirational, that was not an achiever. So to be told that I'm empowering Tara is strange to me <laughs> because I don't know any other way. Mr. It was what I grew up knowing and therefore what I grew up seeing. And I'd just like to close up with this. That, you know, ladies, please understand something. It's important that you are able to be all and do all that God has created you to be not just for the sake of the world, not just for the sake of God, but especially for the sake of your children. Because every time a woman achieves success, accomplishes, and is still a fantastic mother, a fantastic wife, and an, 
When you do that, you are doing two things without knowing. Number one, you are giving permission to your daughters to be. But number two, you are giving permission to your sons to allow their wives to be. So, so I just wanted to let you know that the B Women's Conference is critical not only to the women in this generation, but to the children that we're raising, the sons and the daughters, the men and the women that we're raising in the next generation. And so a strong woman is a woman who knows that she is born of God with capacities to impact, to excel, to be not one or the other, but all together. She can be a strong wife, a strong mother. She can be a strong career woman, a strong business woman. She can be a strong nation builder, but most importantly, a strong woman of God. And her strength does not have to intimidate her husband. Thank you so much. Both of you are twins. Both of you were brought back to be born in Nigeria. <laughs> I don't think it was a mistake <laughs> that you both have Nigerian passports only. Thank you so much, um, Minister Jirutoi. I'd like to acknowledge the presence um, of Bishop Feb Idahosa. He's a friend of the house, and we love to have him here. And I know he brings greetings from his sweetheart as well. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> right. So, Pastor Kodju. What, what's the question? <laughs> the question is, what in your upbringing, what is it about your, the way you were brought up that makes you the kind of man that allows a woman to be strong? And what's your definition of a strong woman? A strong woman will be a woman who can I want to look I want to frame it right. All right, let me ask, answer you, then I'll frame it so they don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Thank you. All right, I think this is better. All right. First of all, I what I was what I told um was, I don't know how I got myself into this. <laughs> how they managed to get me into this place full of women. But, 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 but my story, in fact, is remarkably similar. All right, because I also was brought back. All right, it was one day where they were having a conversation. And my mother said, ah, you mean if I just waited two months for you to have been British? I, I turned around, I said, what, what exactly are you saying? <laughs> All right, so it's like that. But in terms of, like he said, all right, um, women, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to lose women in the answers we want to give because our backgrounds are similar. Our backgrounds may not be very common. So I don't want people, all right, so I will say it in a way that um, even, and I think this, will, this, this conversation, at least this question, is men really that should hear it very well. All right, because uh, my mother, um, I mean, is a medical doctor, she's a professor of medicine, all right, her best friend, is also a professor, first woman to become a commissioner in Western State. Her classmate was the first appeal, uh, court of appeal woman appointed. Our next door neighbor was the first senior advocate female in Nigeria. Uh, so if I look on the street I grew up, I think six of the women living on that road are professors of medicine. All right, we have judges, we have all of that. So I, like he said, I never, and I just, I couldn't contemplate being in a place where a woman wasn't achieving all that she was supposed to achieve as a person. Now, what I want to say is this. 
some of these women I'm talking about made they, their children did not suffer one day from any form of neglect by reason of the pursuit of their careers. These women, as far as I know, did not show any disrespect to their husbands by reason of the pursuits of their careers. Some of them did better than their husbands because they were in the same profession. But there was nothing like any, I, I can't remember any form of any uh, kind of you know, rudeness or any form of conflict concerning that. Let me, let me just give an example here. And these women didn't play with their children. My mother, I remember her friend, because she was in hospital, so I went to see her. So this, her best friend, who was the first commissioner in Western State, called. And she said, I give God you the phone. You know, we are friends. And she always called me Buenos Aires because it was a nickname she gave to me. And this was a, Buenos Aires is the capital of Argentina. I came from a conference that my mother had been planning to attend for three years. I fell ill. I was in the hospital. And all her family, everybody told her that, look, go. I will take care of him. He'll be OK. She said she's not going anywhere. She will cancel. This her best friend from then on named me Buenos Aires because she sacrificed and she knew something that had to do with her career and had to do with her future. Now, just let me say this here. Her immediate junior sister, all right, also grew up, did her PhD, was commissioner of finance in Imo State and commissioner of education in Imo State. The next sister is a professor of biochemistry. Yeah. So I, I was surrounded by very, but none of them at any stage showed any form of, uh, there was no conflict. So I understood. Now, if a person doesn't have that background, it will be because if you grew up in a background where power was exercised by controlling. I mean, I remember my father borrowed my mother money to build houses. On the table, you say, where's my money now? Ah, pay back my money. She said, I'll pay. She paid back the money. She, there was nothing like, because you are the man, uh, you, you, all the money must come from you, and I will fold my hands, and I won't provide anything. So when I talk about a strong woman here, uh, we're talking about a woman that, um, like he said, can stand her own all right, completely in herself without, um, I don't know how to put this, that it won't sound wrong, but without being defined in the context of her husband. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying here? But at the same time, recognizes the position of the husband. In other words, it is strength that we are talking about here in humility. Now, I understand, please get this that not many men can cope with that. That's a discussion that has to be had with, with, with men. But not many men can cope with that. Um, so, and as we go in this discussion, uh, maybe we'll get to it, that even as you are growing, and you may be more powerful, or the power center in the home is changing by reason of your growth and development, you have to be very wise and smart about how you go about it. Thank you very much, sir. Um, as you put um, you both referred to the fact that your experience, your background that's similar is not necessarily everybody's experience. Most people actually don't have that experience. So for someone who's had a different experience, um, this question now goes to Mr. Fela Jurochoe. Um, and you did say earlier on that, you know, we're made in the nature of God, but the nurture of men. How do you then raise or build a strong woman and a woman you know how do you become that strong woman and overcome the obstacles of the narratives of your experience mm. that is such a brilliant question so the first thing I would say is um, 
the strength of anyone comes from their identity. And you must know who you are for you to be who you are meant to be. The job of nurturing, whether it's in the home by parents, or in schools, by teachers, in, in the workplace, by managers, in, in the neighborhood, um, by neighbors, all of that work is to affirm the ladies or the girls that we see, because if we can teach them or train them up in the way that they should go, then we've set the foundation that they cannot depart from. And, and I can quickly just take a pivot from here to understand that if the Bible says train up a child, it means that it is possible to train down that child. And so we have to be careful to understand that what does train up mean? Train up means to become and to affirm that person in the time of their youth so that the things and the values that you put into them from that time, when they become older, they don't need to change those values. So the kind of thing that we are hearing right now in B Conference, the wisdom that Pastor Kodju just shared just effortlessly like that in the last few minutes. We as mothers, aunties, sisters have the responsibility not only to hear it but to share it with the youngest ones amongst us. Because that's when we begin to actually affirm them and tell them who they are. So, ladies, can I tell you who you are for a second? Eh? Should I bust that side? So, there are three things I want to quickly refer to and they are all from the scriptures because in the end, your identity cannot be drawn outside where the word of God really is. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, God created man. But when he created man, he created man male and female. So, man was not a gender, man was an agenda. Male and female, God created man. But then God does something very interesting. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, God forms man whom he had created in 127. But it's now in Genesis 2 and verse 22 that God then makes woman. So you realize that God created, God formed, and then God made. The word formed in the Hebrew is called yatsa. It is the kind of production that the focus is on performance. Get it done. Ear, hear, eyes, see, nose, breathe, mouth, talk. It's all about function. But the word made, it's called pana. Somebody say pana. No, no, ladies, say pana. <laughs> the word pana means perfect. So where God formed man for function, when it was time to pana woman, <laughs> She didn't lose her function, but she now had the form. So it was finish. That's the word pana, to finish, to perfect, to... So you realize that men, we have a nose. Our nose can breathe. That's all that matters. Our ear can hear, no matter how big it is. We are not panad. We are yatsad for function. But women are more delicate in the finishing. So her nose is not like our own. She can breathe, but mm, she, her nose fine. She can see, but ah, oh, child, see eyes. I don't know whether you've noticed, even the eyebrow self, how is it that men have eyebrow? Our eyebrow can go in different directions. 
But women's own from birth. I don't know whether you understand. Somebody say panar. You see, you were panard. And you have to understand it is part of your identity. Now, if you were perfected, then you have to recognize that, because a lot of times people say things like, you know, the woman, the woman is the weaker vessel. How do you, how do you, you know, the weaker vessel, the weaker vessel, she's weaker. And then I say, if you understand Pana, you would understand why God says his strength is made perfect. His strength is panard in the finishing of this person that you call weaker. And any man that thinks his wife is weaker should only try and carry a bed sheet around his stomach and tie it. Bed sheet or pillow. Just carry pillow for one day and tie it on your back. Carry it around the place. Pillow, I didn't say, I didn't say dumbbell. Just carry pillow, tie it for one day, and when you understand how your back is aching you, you now understand the kind of strength that a woman has to be able to carry a child for nine months, and she will not even complain to you. Not only will she drop, if she's like Tara, she will drop and ready to pick another one, na, na, na. So that within, within three years, 2002, 2003, 2005, she has already dropped three. That is Pana. That's real strength, but it also comes from being able to know who you are in Christ, know who you are in God. But the real work that you asked is, we all have a role to play. Fathers have a role to play in sharing with their daughters, sharing with their nieces, sharing. Fathers have a role to play in the way that they exemplify what strength means by empowering their wives. You see, because children learn from what they see more than what you say. So tell me that I'm the apple of your eye, that's fine. But show me what the apple of your eye means by the way you treat my mother. And then I would understand what that means. So, so we all, and I'm not saying women, but women do have a role to play. But men have a role to play too in making sure that we let the women know who they are, how they are, and what it is that they can do. And then, in, and then challenging them all the time to say, you can, you can, because they can. Thank you. That, that definitely deserves a round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing. And now we understand why men have 10 pairs of shoes and women have 40. Abby, <laughs> we were panad, right? Thank you so much. <laughs> Pastor Podju, we have a question for you. So I hear women say, um, yeah, it's, it's good to say all these things, what we're supposed to be. But the Bible says women should be seen and not heard. Or other scriptures that people have knocked over women's heads, you know, to make them feel like, or to make us feel like we shouldn't be in the forefront of certain things. We'd like you to just speak to that. No, uh, let's, let's give context to women seen, not heard, okay? I mean, first one has to do with, in terms of a woman, how she should influence her husband if there's a decision that has to be made and you don't, I mean, you can't be arguing back and forth concerning that. All right, but if you're talking about a woman, I mean, that's not in context of a woman excelling in school and fulfilling her career and going ahead and getting, all right, everything she wants to um, get done. The second will be um, a cultural aspect. And you can't, you can't um, separate the way people will make decisions and the way they will do things from the culture that they grew up under. So culturally speaking, if a man, all right, 
um, sees himself in a certain role and a woman um, has a different background from that man. In other words, she grew up in homes like this where you are supposed to, where you can express yourself. And the man grew up in a home where the woman was brought up to take care of the home as a housewife and to be kind of docile, all right, and all of that. Then you are going to have a cultural mismatch. And what has to happen is she has to wisely navigate it. And I think women should understand this that everything a man does, and this is the cardinal sin against the male species, once you understand that, disrespect. Now, the reason why he is pushing for all those things and saying you can't end this and all of that is that he thinks all those things are going to lead to disrespect. He, he feels that, if, and secondly, if you earn more than him, you have more power more than him, and you say anything, he listens to it in the context of disrespect. In other words, if I earn more than you, and you say that, you know, I think the children should go to these expensive schools, this is what I want them to go to, he looks at it and says that, uh, Look, my friend, what are you talking about? I can't, I, don't, I can't afford that. She says, we'll pray. That's the thing. If she's any more than him, and she says the same thing, I want children to go to this school. The next thing he says is, is it because you have the money and I do not have the money? That's not where she may be coming from. But that is the sound that he's going to hear. So, the, particularly in this environment, you will have to pray for a lot of wisdom and the application of that wisdom to be able to navigate your way, all right? But just understand that the fundamental thing in the heart of that person is an issue of disrespect. Once he believes that he is not being disrespected, all right, uh, um, I mean, if he's at home and they're calling you to speak everywhere and you get on the podium and you first of all speak about the fact that I will not be here um, even if everything you are saying <laughs> you may actually may, may or may not be there all right without but you make him reassure and all of that then you begin to reduce the tension all right that is there but we can't run away from the fact that culturally speaking uh, I mean, I can't deny that, that men in this society that we live in, culturally speaking, feel that um, um, authority and power is based on holding the instruments of production and uh, the woman being. And where that happens, uh, the woman has to be very wise about her communication and how she goes on about it. All right, to make the man feel comfortable, all right, with that, you know, and until he gets comfortable with it. But it's possible that he can, very possible he can get comfortable with it if you are not rushing and if you are not being brash about it and if you are not uh, throwing it all in his face, he can get uh, comfortable with it. Uh, I believe that, that's the reality of what we face. Can I just try to with it? Yeah. Can I just add, add a little addendum to that? Um, but please help me acknowledge you know, the wisdom that Pastor Koju has just said. Pastor Koju, do you know that I think, uh, first, I'm a certified life, um, I'm a certified executive coach. Um, and it, you know, I'm certified in the, the top school in the world on executive coaching. It's called Beckley Executive Coaching Institute. And one of the things that I came to realize, Pastor Koju, is that coaching is actually a life skill. And executive coaching is by far one of the most important skills that every married woman, but every woman must know, must have. So what is executive coaching? Executive coaching 
is the ability to guide a person who has been vested with power and authority in a way that the person does not even know that you are guiding them. Such that through the methodology, the framework, and the tools you use, you actually find the light in the person, the solutions are brought out from the person. You didn't tell the person this is the solution. You use questions to lead the person there without in any way tampering with their authority and their position. Because most times, executive coaches do not have the authority within the context of the organization that they are coaching the person who has that authority. So I'm coaching a CEO of an organization. He's telling me what his challenges or his a challenge, he's complaining, but I have to go through a model. And can I give that to you very quickly? Two minutes. It's called grow. Somebody say grow. Grow. G means goals. R means reality. O means options and W means way forward. So as a woman, you want your children to go to a particular school. But you're not going to tell your husband, I want my children to go to this school. You're going to ask him, so with that, as, as regards to the children's education, can you please share, what is your vision for this? <laughs> so the guy begins to say, you know, my dream is for our children to act. So which kind of schools will have that kind of? Now, if he mentions some schools, but because of the current reality, he does not mention the one that you want. You say, those are amazing schools. What about this one? How does it compare with that? He says, that's a fantastic school too. It's just that because of this money, then you say, ah, my, huh, my sugar. <laughs> Guys, I'm just telling you what the name that I, I hear. When I, when I first got married, Tara used to call me brother. She's never called me by my name. I'm six years older than her, but she's never called me by my name once. The day that Tara will call me fella, I know that heaven will come down that day. Because whatever I must have done that will cause her, and I'm not, I never told her not to call me my name, please. Not that I said, why are you to call me? No. She used to call me brother, but... In 22 years, I've gone from brother to sugar. <laughs> Guy, you have to clap for even me that I'm doing something right. So, 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 so now you have to pet his, like Pastor Pojo was talking about, his ego so that he can drop his armor. Because his armor is to protect his ego. And every time he senses disrespect coming, he has to protect that ego by lifting up his armor. Once he knows that you are not there to, you are actually there to help him manifest the vision of where the children were. And you say to him, you know that God will provide for you, Mike. And you know that even if God wants to use me to help you, <laughs> Then your children, don't call it my children at that time. Say your children will go to the best schools that God has empowered you to go. My husband, you can do it. You can make it. You can. By the time you are done, the man says, hey, which school did you say? That school, they will go there. In other words, you have coached him. You have coached him into the dream that he has that he didn't even know how to get there. So I want you ladies to please know, executive coaching is one of the critical skills that you will require if you want to be all and do all and not have bruises along the way. Please let's, let's give them a round of applause. A big round of applause because they've literally answered the next question. So I know we've all taken lessons from that, and we want to take some questions from the audience. So we're going to move quickly to the men. We have a question for you to speak to the men. Ah. Yeah. So these men with the armor over their ego, <laughs> you know, with strong women around them, 
how should they handle this? Having strong women around them. The women have heard what you've said here. They've broken through cultural barriers. They've, they've go, broken through whatever experience they have and they've had and they are becoming strong. So how should the men handle this? How should they deal with that? And how, what do they need to do to nurture the women, their wives, and other women around them to be strong women? So let's, let's speak to the men. Let's start with Pastor Koji. Well, first of all, you know, for you to be able to get to the next level, you, like what I was talking about Koji, you need to go through a proper mind renewal. Okay? Now, so, I mean, when I'm listening, there has to be a mind renewal. Listen, when I started church, my first landlord was a very wealthy man. He called me. He said, look, go and look for a strong woman to marry. Hmm? See this work you're doing? You'll just be relaxing. She will carry the work for you. He gave me two examples of pastors he knew in, in town at that time who had strong women. I laughed. He said, it will make your work lighter. Look for someone with strength. Now, the strength, the point I'm trying to get to, the strength that men may consider to be intimidating, it's because of the way their mind is. Once your mind is renewed, you will actually realize that you have a major asset on your hands. Now, the issue there is that you just need to like, just let's say you are not really giving up authority and all of that, but it's that ego thing that you were saying that you are surrendering. I mean, there's something you have to surrender, mm -hmm. right? In order to allow her to have expression. And, and when you surrender that, then, and you see it, but you actually have to have a change in your mindset in terms of the way you look at things and how. And once you once that change has occurred on the inside of yourself, you will realize that the, a strong woman who is accomplishing a lot, who is doing a lot of stuff here, who may be getting um, um, accolades and all of that, um, and powerful recognition, all right? I mean, I mean, well, because my mother may be watching, so let me not say something. <laughs> I've made up my mind I won't say something. But, you know, powerful recognition and all of that can actually be a massive advantage to you as a person, provided you're a serious-minded man oh, and you want to, even if you're not serious-minded, even actually, even if you're not serious-minded and you are quite lazy, a very hard-working, achieving woman, will cover your nakedness for you. I mean, even if you're lazy, all right? So you see it that way in terms of an asset that the woman, all right, actually, I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's the same principle about a business when you run a one-man business and you want to expand the business. You want to multiply the business, you have to allow people in leadership to assume positions of authority. They assume positions of authority, a lot of accolades will go to them because of the things that they are accomplishing. Many of the things, and the way, like, I just want to put that, the way God has designed it is this. Even if that woman is accomplishing more than you visibly, it is the counsel you are giving at home. The way he has designed it, if she asks you that, look, I want to do one, two, three, four, five, the way God has designed it, the advice you give to her, she'll find out that it is the advice of the husband that actually got me to this particular point. Because you are the head of that union. And the head means the thinking part there in the union. And she herself will come to realize that actually I have a covering. That this man may just be sitting down at home watching football, but if I, the way God has designed it is that my own personal protection will be found in the ideas that are coming out of his mind and not necessarily the ideas that are coming out of other people's minds out there. So you will find out, all right, that even 
if you may have a person you relate to, you feel is a mentor in the field, that the husband's ideas will actually have certain protective aspects. So people come to realize that, and you see that in the synergy of the relationships, all right, in which you're doing. I mean, just like a, 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 a wife and a man, if your wife tells you something, and she's very strong on what she has said, very strong on what she has said, I would suggest you should press bricks because she has been positioned in your life, all right, for a reason. Even if you're arguing and she says something and you know she's strong about it, you understand that, you know that, look, this thing may be for my own personal protection and later on in life you realize that what she actually said was actually correct. So there's a dynamics in the marital union that God puts there that no matter how, you know, big you become, he has a way of humbling you inside the context of that relationship. That you may hire somebody and it is that person you hired who will ruin the entire business that the husband looked at and said, you see that guy, I don't like him. Oh, I just don't like that guy. And then you said, no, he's intelligent. He went to Harvard, he went to this. By the time you finish, the guy cleans out half of the business. Next time you will understand what a covering is. All right, and no matter the strategy sessions you are doing, you will know that I have to go home and ask my person at home, what do you think about one, two, three, four? And then after what he tells you, one, two, three, four. So if men understand that too, you will know that, all right, you have, all right, um, that kind of, I'm trying to remember a story about what Bishop Redepo told his, um, um, his, somebody told me, um, yes, and he said that's how he understood authority structure, that he was supposed to go somewhere, he got into the car, and um, Bishop Guido was told somewhere, he said, come, inside me, she said, follow this guy as he's going. He looked back and said, well, I, there's no reason for this guy to follow me, and he took off in his car and he was going. All of the equipment they had dropped on the floor, and the guy was still driving on. It was the guy coming behind that packed everything. He said it was that day he realized what authority structure really is that when there's authority structure and there's covering in a place, the suggestions that they make, all right, actually is to help and to cover you. Thank right? you. Now, with that, I'm trying to say that, so as a woman, even if you are accomplishing more in your field and your profession and all of that, you understand that the man that God has put in your life there's a reason why in scripture it says the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. And he didn't say the hair, all right, is the covering. He says the head, all right. So the husband actually is the head, which means that any decisions you are making run it through your head in it, and you find that there will be security in what you are doing. That's just the balance of it in terms of that. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Um, God bless you, man of God. And I hope that maybe there will come a time when at women's conferences, we're not just having a panel of men, we would actually have a breakout session for the men to come in, even during a, a women's conference, even if it's for just one session. Because I think that the wisdom that women are getting is so powerful but I hope that you also know that the, the job is to share. You're not, it's not just for you to receive, but go and share. Um, but I, I really hope that the men will take time to sit down with Pastor Kojo and just hear, you know. Three things I want to quickly talk about, very quickly. When I speak to men, I am very quick to acknowledge that men are the head. The question, if men are the head, is then what is the woman? Is she the neck that turns the head? Maybe. Is she the heart of the head? I don't. But if I were to go to the scriptures, God does not call the woman the hand, the legs, the heart, the stomach, the lungs, or anything. What God says is that in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 4, you can put it up if you can for us, media. 
the Bible is exceptionally clear as to what the woman is, especially the one that Pastor Podra has been speaking about, the prudent woman. And the Bible says, let's read together, one, two, three, go. An excellent wife is the what? Everybody, let's do it one more time. An excellent wife is the... Stop. Let's do it one more time. An excellent is the... Where does the crown sit? When men get to understand this, that the glory of the king is in the jewels in his crown, then he knows that he's not competing with his crown. It is his kingdom that is affirmed by his crown. So that with every accomplishment of the wife is another jewel in his crown. I tell men, whose name is she bearing? Has anybody noticed? If you go and Google Feladrotoe, you will see Tara Feladrotoe. Tara Feladrotoe. Ta Whether it is Fela or Tara, the Feladrotoe name, which is part of the begging I want to beg you. Women, as we give you our name, Let's go to the second part of that particular scripture. But she who causes... Please now, can you bring fame to our name, not shame to our name? Can you make up your mind that when you are working in your office, you are not just a person, you are carrying a brand. And that the quality of your work is not only in affirming who you are, but also whose you are. Does somebody understand where I'm coming from? So, well, and, and the good thing about it is that at no time did you not carry a man's name. So don't come and start behaving and see what do you mean? I mean, I'm my own brand. Hey, calm down. First, you are, you are under the brandship of your father. Now you have relocated brandship to your husband. But every woman must be ready to say, I am a value creator to the brand that I carry so that I can bring a jeweled crown on the, hus on the head of my husband. And, 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 and when men hear this, I can't tell you how many women, because we, we have a platform called the locker room for men. And the locker room is just a place where men come in and the promise is they come in as men, they live as better men. And, and the idea is when we're having those conversations is you get to hear the guys and Honestly, it's everything Pastor Pojo has been sharing that they bear with us and say, you know, what if she earns more than me? What if she does this than me? What if, and then when they get that perspective, all of a sudden the way they see changes, the way they think changes, and the way they act changes. So I've always said, never try to change any man's attitude. Just change his perspective. If you can change his perspective, his perspective will change the way he sees the way he sees will change the way he thinks about it. The way he thinks about it will change the way he acts upon it. So that's the first most important thing. I know the time is almost fast spent. Let me quickly show you something else that is very interesting. I would need media to help me out with it. I want you to zoom in on this if you can. So that everybody can see only this paper on the screen. Or do I, do you want somebody else to come and hold it closer? But I need to do something to this, I need to do something to this paper. Do you want me to stand closer? Can I? I, I, I want to do something to the paper, so if, if it, it's okay. Can you hold this for me, please? Okay. Can everybody see this? Okay. Okay, you're there? Can we see it on the screen, please? It's too bright. Is it better? Can you see it? Is the light? Okay, what can we do? Do you want us to turn? Yeah. I'm 
sorry, I just, I hope this helps. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Oh, so what do you see? Tell me. One, two, three, go. Let's go. Fantastic. Now, remember that when God created man, male and female created he them. And that man was alone. In fact, the word alone, some people have said it was all one, all in one. And what happened was whilst God formed the man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into it, God never formed the woman out of the dust of the earth. What God did was God took the woman out of the man. Does anybody see it now? So when God took the woman out of the man, or whichever one you want the woman to be, essentially what happened was man therefore had a void in him that only the woman can complete. Somebody's getting this? But there is a danger. Before God took the woman out, man had all the strengths. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now God has taken out some of the strengths. And so the man, let's say this is the man, can be two, three, and six. But he's no longer one, four, and five. The challenge is when man is looking for two in his wife because he's two. And start saying, you, you don't even, because it's normal and natural for him, but he's looking for it in his wife. So let's say the man is, is an extrovert. The man is a business person, is enterprising. And he's wondering, why is my wife not enterprising? And he's translating the strength of his enterprise as though it were a weakness in his unenterprising wife. Forgetting that, listen, if there are two of us that are the same, one of us is unnecessary. So the idea is I'm supposed to take the marketer in me and add it to the administrator in my wife. Not be looking for the marketer in her and be wondering why doesn't she have it. And the only thing also is that, guys, I'm now coming back to where it touches you is that your strength is in his weak spot. Which means when you begin to power and boast about your strength, why can't you even, why can't you, he's not even driven. He's, you are the one that is driven for the two of us. Your job is to take my ability to plan and your ability to execute and find ways to honor the planner in me and support me with the execution in you so that we can have results. So don't compare, because every time a woman compares herself with a man, she's likely to compare her strengths with his weakness. Because what she has as a strength, he has it in her. Do you get it? So this is the idea. Can I leave this here, here with you? Complete, not compete. And when you complete, he doesn't need his armor to come down. But when you compete, he has to show that he's better than you. The glory of God is the only thing that can, if you touch it, it will kill you. And man was made in the image of God. So if you touch the ego of a man, even if he doesn't kill you physically, you are dead to him. You are dead to him. You are dead to him. So when, and I'm not in any way endorsing at any time that any man should ever be unfaithful to his wife. I'm only explaining that sometimes when you see the, the husband of this brilliant woman who then seems to be 
and you go and look at who is the girlfriend. The girlfriend, she didn't even go to school. She didn't even this. She's not even fine. Please understand, at that moment, he's not looking for fine because you were fine and yet you are dead. So everything he's looking for is what you are not. You are brilliant. He doesn't want that anymore. Because your brilliance touched his ego and you were dead to him. So ladies, please understand. God brought you to finish the man, to perfect him. That was your role, to perfect him. Your words should be the sweetest words he will ever hear in the course of this day. The look you give him in the morning, oh my God, he, no, no, nobody else born of woman should be able to hail your husband more than you. And it doesn't start when you get married. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 18, he that finds a wife. So you become a wife before you are found. You become a wife before you are found. It's only because you are a wife that you are found. And then you become his wife. Do you understand? Which means that when you are talking to your brother at home, you have to be a wife. You are not his wife, but you are a wife. Use your brother to practice how you will talk to your husband. Teach your daughters how to treat their, your, your sons so that they can know how to... Be. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes better. Practice makes easier. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? So ladies, as you be, please help men be come. Because, because, and I close with this, any girl can have a baby, but it takes a real woman to give birth to a man. I am the product of a woman. I was born by my mother. I was born again by Christ. And I was born into the man that I am because of Tara. The words she speaks to me at night are the words that you hear me speak during the day. The person she helps me to become at night is the one you clap for on stage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Please, don't be just women. Be women who can build real men that will do great things. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're, we're definitely beyond, we've gone beyond the time allotted, um, but we have a small space for questions from the audience. Just one question, only one question. One very, very important, very, very important question. Okay, please go ahead. You have a mic. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judith Courage at Hyero, and I want to say thank you very much to the panel. Thank you, Pastor Fortune. Thank you for thank you, Mr. Durotoye. So um, I just recently concluded my project, and it's on the role of social media sensitization on boy-child development in Nigeria. So I'm very passionate about the boy-child, and I know that this is the only opportunity that I have to ask you, Mr. Durotoye, because I have an interview session that I do on my YouTube channel, if you'd be willing to be my guest. <laughs> That is what you call shoot your shots. <laughs> Ladies, should I be on her show? Yeah. You have heard the answer. So we'll make it happen. Dam Larry, Dam Larry, please connect. There's a gentleman there. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you.
That was bold. She has obviously been strengthened. So we have room for one more question. Now, this one should be a real question. Who has a question? Okay. There's a lady putting up her hand there. Praise God. Okay, so I checked the dictionary meaning of ego, a person's sense of self-esteem or self-importance. So I want to ask, sir, is ego scriptural? Is it same as image and like we are created in the image of God? So is it is the same thing, ego and image? For we to be able to, you know, try to protect the ego of our men. Uh, but what? what? <laughs> Good point. Protect your men. Because that, that question you will, it will now become definition in the house. Somebody defined it though as ego, edge God out. So if I want to say it, right, ego in itself, if you want to say it by definition, it's not. It's not healthy. But don't go home and say this is ego, is self-esteem, and the image of God inside. Are you following what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Yeah. If I can just quickly throw something. Look, again, when God made man, I told you at the beginning man was not a gender, which means that it's not that women also do not have a sense of self-esteem. And let me be clear that the man's self-esteem is not dependent on you not having yours. It just means that, like Pastor Poju just said, just help him protect it. Protect his sense of, of personhood. You know, um, Tara is reading a book. I wish I could remember the name of the author, but it has to do with honor. And this, apparently, it's a massive book. Tara has never, I testify before God, Tara has never dishonored me. That I will say that I felt dishonored by her. So her reading of the book apparently is because for many of the women, she's mentoring women a lot now. And some of the women are having some conversations and challenges and she's realizing what she didn't even know that she has almost naturally, effortlessly that the problem is a problem of honor. That when she asks them, what do you admire about your husband? Some of them struggle to find four things, five things that they admire about their husbands. But when she begins to work on them, she says, what about this thing? Oh, yes, it's true. Actually, yes, it is so. So it is, those things were there but they were no longer conscious of it. Because in the end, what the Bible says is seek and you will find. So let me be clear about what that means. Two meanings. Number one, it means that anything I look for, even if it was not there, it will be created. The second thing is that anything I find, I looked for it even if I did not intentionally look for it. So if I'm looking for the strengths of my husband, I will find. If I'm looking for his weaknesses, I will find. If I'm looking for what it is that I can admire in him, I will find. If I'm looking for the things I can disdain him for, I will find. So the, 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 the work that I think women also have to now get to is this learning the art of honoring. And you know what? We don't struggle so much. When the person is our boss at work, Somehow, we honor the man even if he has some of the same issues as my husband or your, you, know, you know what I mean. Or even the pastor. Or the pastor. So let me be clear. Honor is first an intentional choice. To say I'm going to honor this man not because he has earned my honor, 
but because I am an honorable woman. And such as I have, give I unto thee. So if I don't have dishonor, I cannot dishonor you, even if what you did did not deserve honor. I can only give you what I have. So women, please understand, honor starts with you. It is only the honor that you have that you can give. Women, please understand that the self, um, what did she call it? Self-esteem. Self-esteem starts with you. When you have self-esteem, then you will be able to honor the self-esteem in others. Last thing I want to say. We found out in the book, because I'm reading the book too. Anytime Tara gets a book, we read together. Why? So that our minds can be on the same frequency. So that we can gist. Sorry, I, that's something that somebody else has to pick. Your husband is doing MBA. You are not doing. But he's bringing the book home. Read it. MBA is not about the class. It's about the knowledge. When he brings it home, you read it. So you guys can gist about the marketing concept. Therefore, he has a gisting partner. So Tara and I usually read books. And, and the first definition of honor, can I give it to you? Are you ready? It says to acknowledge the God in that person. Man of God. That it will be natural for me to honor you once I understand that God is in you. So I'm honoring the God in you, not just you. So please understand, you don't have to be a rag for you to be able to honor your husband. You don't have to be, a, uh, you don't have to be disdained. In fact, if anything, you need to recognize the God in you and let the God in you honor the God in your husband. And even if the God in your husband has not fully manifested into the person you want him to be, let the God in you call out the God in him in the place of prayer. <laughs> call him to be the man that you want him to be in the place of prayer. Spirit to spirit, there is no time and there is no space. So birth your man in prayer first and then use your mouth to birth him in, in the physical. Okay, I, I just also want to say, I, I want to say something and I hope my mother never hears this, but let me just say this. That, that's if I get it. Let me say this. Women must understand that there is a lot of pressure on men. And that has to be appreciated. And when we talk about honor, because people can look and say, what, what is there? And if you look at the man, maybe very little for you to find to say you want to honor. The issue is that a lot of men go through life without a sense of gratitude from their wives. And a man, for example, I mean, for example now, as I'm here now, there are many things that I am thinking about, projecting about church ministry into two, three years that I may not burden anybody with those thoughts, but you carry them. The way a man is designed, a man doesn't want to be telling people the problem. Ah, you know, a woman can come back and say, hey, you know what happened was uh, this happened. A man won't say that. So he's carrying much more than you realize. And when there is no gratitude, even if you just come and in your own private, quiet time, look at issues that the man is doing. Because let me give an example. A woman comes out of school, she gets to one. The man comes out of school, let's say he gets to one. They get jobs, let's say, as bankers automatically it is transferred to the man to provide. He has to pay rent for the house. He has to pay children's school fees. He has, just the society now transfers that naturally to him. But it doesn't mean that the earning power of that man is much more than the earning power of the woman. So when he looks at things on the outside, let's even say social media, Instagram, he doesn't see women demonstrating success with saying, I'm driving a Bentley. He sees men doing that. So there's pressure on him. Now, if the little things that he's doing is not acknowledged, all right? If those things that he's doing where he's struggling and trying to get things done, 
at home and, you know, even putting on the generator, doing all of those things, those things are not acknowledged, right? The little things he's doing, it begins to pile up on the man. It is not strange, and I want to say this, that there's a doctor who, like Kenneth Copeland's doctor, he says, sometimes he sees women coming and the man is almost bent while the woman is erect. And he knows that the man has carried so much burden in life beyond what that woman has carried. So there has to be that issue there, all right, of, of gratitude to the person. Because it's when you overlook the little things the person is doing that there's a tendency in that person, uh, because it's this ego and, and self-esteem, uh, self that there is, you know, the tendency in that person to, to now, you now start having problems inside that marriage because there's really no acknowledgement. I mean, for the men too, they should acknowledge what women are doing, but, but it's important. That I'm trying to say that men go through a lot of things that women don't have any idea that they are going through these things. And so it's important that those things be acknowledged in terms of little things. Look, a, a chap came to see me to speak at a men's conference, and he told me three men who appeared successful. One went to Songo Tedo and pulled a gun and pulled the trigger. It just so happened that the bullets didn't come out. All right, he dropped it. He gave me a second occasion in their church. He said, this is the pressure that men are going through. He himself, he told, told me a story about himself. He said he was almost, he had cyanide, he was going to take poison. He told me this. He said it was a classmate of his that walked in, a woman, and she saw him and said, what's going on? Pulled it from him and had to, that she didn't even know how to tell his wife that your husband almost committed suicide. She had to go through somebody else and, and that one came in and behaved like there was something and finally, so the wife never really knew that the husband came to that particular point where he was almost going to take his life. And he may not say it. I mean, if it's a woman, she'll say it. But if it's a man, he may not say it. So silently, it's important that, look, these things be acknowledged because he's going through a lot of things, all right? If a man goes into the midst of his classmates, whether you like it or not, the evaluation is how successful you are as a person. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the conversation. So you can even go to a party and come back depressed without the woman knowing that that thing has been heavy on his heart. And I think a lot of people are missing that in terms of, um, um, I mean, Look, look, my, I mean, I've, I've, I've said to you the theory. Hmm? In practice, my father traveled to work in Saudi Arabia and started earning multiples of what he was earning as, a, as his brother. Now, I saw change in dynamics. Uh, uh, let me, uh, see, we've spoken English now. Let me tell you, there was change in dynamics. There was something I saw from, because of that of his new ending power. So there's something that he does to a man. And when a man doesn't end in that way that he's supposed to end, look, look, there is no going around it. He feels a sense of being inadequate. And the last person that should in any way shoot any arrow to him should be inside that house. The Yorubas have a saying that the enemy outside can't kill you. If the enemy inside uh, I, has not killed you. Many men die inside their house before they come out because of that sense of, uh, because almost love is almost defined by your performance of certain duties. And once he is unable to perform those uh, duties there, there is a diminishing all right, of, of certain things. So I think women also should look at that properly and be very sensitive, all right, to their husbands in terms of um, um, that. And when they do do things, um, they, there's a sense of gratitude that you do. 
even if you buy a card and just drop it and say, look, I just want to thank you, all right, all these years, you know, you've done this and all of that, I think that those things will go a long way, all right, in helping the man when we are talking about honor and we are talking about those things. Because to be honest with you, I must make a case for men. Many men. Es especially. Uh, uh, pressure, wow. There's pressure. At, at, uh, at 1,000 naira to 1 dollar. Dollar. At 750 naira to 1 liter. Please, pressure, wow. <laughs> so and, and, and we recognize that it's, it's it, it, you, the ladies feel that pressure too, but like Pastor said, you know, because of the burden that is on men, as if you don't want to do wrong, in a declining economy, it becomes even more challenging. Mm. Because the people who sometimes seem to be flying in that economy may be the people who are doing the things that you don't even want your own children to do. And yet, the person that is doing those things is buying some things for his wife that you are now expecting that your husband, uh -uh, look at what this guy bought for his wife. They didn't tell you what he did to get the money to buy that thing for his wife. But you are only saying, ah, hey, did you see in Kechi's car? And did you see in Kechi's car? It's not that I didn't see because all of us saw the car. <laughs> so you are not telling me that was I blind when in Kechi drove. What you are telling me is, have you seen my own car or the imaginary car that I'm supposed to be driving? And all of those things are the things that I, I really want to acknowledge you and thank you on behalf of the men, Pastor. Because I think that truly you needed to say this. Because we are struggling. The, we, are not, we are not lazier, yet we are earning less. Not in, not, not in nominal terms, but in real value. The things we could do with the money we were taking home is no longer taking us home. So we are getting stuck on the pathway to paying school fees. And he will not ask you that you should help him pay school fees. So you should check and see if he's, if he's behaving a bit way, rub the back, help him massage. It doesn't always lead to the other one. Sometimes it can, and we need that one too. Just sometimes, even if that's what helps us to feel better. And then when we do feel better, talk to us. Remember, coaching is about asking. Coaching is not about telling. So ask us what's going on. And then, if possible, ask that, you know, can I loan you? I have a little bit of a savings. And if he's a good man, when he gets a bit more of that money, he will repay it. <laughs> All right. Um, guys, quickly. Ask no, like, like, like Pastor Podju's father. He will, you know, so let's. But he yeah. never collected all his money back. <laughs> he only said his money should be paid. <laughs> but he never collected. All right. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, sirs. Good afternoon, moderators and everyone. My name is Ngozi. I want to ask a question around a part of male support that is hardly spoken about. And that's where your men who are supportive support and support and support and push you until you... you some women then feel under pressure to meet the career milestones, the business milestones that the men are pushing them to achieve. What do you do? So if you're a woman in that position, how do you navigate? If you're a man, how do you push to the point where you don't, um, the women don't crumble under the pressure of feeling like they are not meeting your expectations or they are not you know, fulfilling their God-given potential? Uh, are you saying, for example, now, let me be clear. You're saying that the man wants you to... So to now your, maybe your husband to, wants you to go and do your master's. He wants you to open your business and somehow... You should be happy now. You, sh <laughs> you should be happy, but there's, there's a pressure. It may not be for everyone, but it's, I, I'm hoping it's intercessory in some way. <laughs> that there are some times that women come under the pressure of just not being ready to move to that next level where the yeah. man wants them to be. Yeah. It might be your father, it might be your husband, it yeah. might be... But there's that male, very goal-oriented, results-driven scenario where sometimes... And like you're even saying, you should be happy, but somehow... All right, before, before Fela answers that, let me just say something. And um, let me just say this. 
I have a relationship with Bishop Oedeko, and he's a very he's a very driven person. If you are with him, and you say you are doing four services, he will say, "When will you start five? If you say you have done this, he will tell you that when are you building the 25,000 seater? So he stretches. And I didn't really like it until I heard Bishop Carlton Pearson back then say this. He said, I became who I became in life because Aura Roberts always stretched me. Now, you need to have somebody that keeps stretching you, all right? All high performers, there is that stretch that, now there's a balance to it, I agree, which means that there's an acknowledgement about how far you have gone and all of that. But if you are in an environment where there is no stretch there, right, then you may end up being very sad when you get, because you look back and you might find out that a lot of your potential was unfulfilled. So people that really achieve things in life have relationships within their life that keep stretching them and demanding more from them. However, it can be unhealthy, all right? But I have realized, I've come to see that it's, you have to be stretched or else what's going to happen is that you are going to see people around you get into certain positions and it's when they are there, you know you should have been in this particular place but because you just didn't go through that straight. That, that's what I just want to say for my own personal, uh, right? It can be unhealthy. Yeah, I don't know how the stretch is going, but you have to have people in your life that uh, stretch it. Okay, if I can just piggyback on what Pastor is saying. You know, one of the advantages of having a head is that they can see sometimes the things that you can't see, sometimes, sometimes. And, you know, it... it Listening to you, it was like as if at one point in time I was listening to Tara because Tara used to talk about how much pressure I was pushing on her as it relates to the growth of the business and the vision. Because don't forget, I'm a professional consultant. My job is to tell you how, but not to do it. <laughs> So, so they, I'll go to a bank and I'll tell them how they will make three times their revenue. The truth be told, if they do what I said, they do make it. But the truth about it is that I'm not there to do the marketing for them. So Tara, at one point in time, will look at me. Eh, it's easy. You think it's easy like that? And the thing almost wanted to become a point where I said, okay, I'll back off. And whatever happens, happens. And then God spoke to me. And God said to me, you need to go and spend a day sitting down, just being in her space and understanding the different things that she deals with. And I did. And she never knew until today that I'm saying it, if she's listening now. I honestly went one of those days. I just said, you know, I just popped into the office. I said I was having a few more meetings and I stayed longer and I just wanted to see the dynamics. Man of God, Pastor Poju. <laughs> what I saw that lady do, she became a superwoman in another level in my eyes. So what I found out that I needed to do therefore was so that I don't take stress and turn it into stress. See, I can take stretch. I want to stretch her. That's one of the things I should do. But if time and chance is not ready for that thing, then it's no longer stretch, it becomes stress. And so what I had to recognize was to change the conversations and start planting those things as, baby, when do you think you will be ready for? And the moment my language changed, she no longer had to be defending her soul against my idea. Now she could open up and say, oh, I think that. And then there are times when I would drop it and she says, no, 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 I'm not ready. Then two weeks, three weeks, two months, six months later, she says, you remember that thing you were talking about? I think the time is now. And I realized it was my ego 
that was bothering me at one time to think, how dare I give you counsel and you will not act on it. I had to become humble enough to recognize that my job is not to tell her as a leader, my job was to coach her. And in coaching, you don't tell, you ask. And once we change the dynamics of it, even the stress in our marriage that could have come from those things disappeared. So I hope that men will recognize that it's not the women only that are supposed to become executive coaches. Men also should learn executive coaching skills. And um, this one is not a shoot your shots because what I have in my spirit, I'm wondering why God is telling me to do it like that. Well, anyway, I'll tell you. Pastor Koju. When you are ready, I will facilitate a 10-day online coaching course for every man that you say, and every woman, I will pull up a class for you. It, it's going to be dedicated to Boju Oyemade, Boju Antonio Oyemade, and everybody, a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand. We have an, we have an executive coaching course. It's called ECC, ECCP. You can check it on. It is, it is the most celebrated course, at least on this side of the Atlantic. It is 10 days, five hours per day, 50 hours of coaching, intensive coaching, understanding the tools, the framework, and everything. I have been led, and I didn't want to say it, I wanted us to get down. I have been led to say, when you are ready, I will facilitate in your honor and to the glory of God an executive coaching certification program just for your people at no cost. It's a five thousand dollar, it's a five thousand dollar program, but we're going to do it at no cost. Listen to this. There's no there's nothing, there's no comma. It is because of the harvest of the seeds you have sown. So this is not a this is not a seed you are expected to give a harvest to. This is in acknowledgement of the blessing that you have been. And it is now time for your own people too to be blessed. Thank you very much, sirs. We have heard a lot this afternoon. We have heard enough for the men and for the women. We have heard that you are not going to be just for yourself. You are going to share this with the men. And I know that if you look at all of what we've heard this afternoon, I know people have questions in their hearts that we have not actually asked. But if you listen to what has been talked about today, you will find the answer to the questions if you go from every side. And so we're going to honor this man and thank them for pouring out of their heart. Let's all rise on our feet and celebrate them. Thank you very much, Pastor Koju. Thank you very much, Mr. Feladro Toye. We are very grateful, sirs. Round of applause, it's not loud.